Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the 2014 Governor's Prayer Breakfast. I'm Major Mike Roberts of the Missouri National Guard, and once again, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I, I was thinking this morning, isn't Missouri weather wonderful? It wasn't too long ago, we had six inches of snow, but the event still went on and everybody made it safely and, and everything worked out. So it really made this morning's less than an inch of snow for most of us a bit of a challenge, but uh, everything seems to work out. Also, uh, having done this, uh, MC this event before, this was awesome. Because when the MC got up and said, please take your seats, everybody did. <laughs> I didn't have to make things up to get you to take your seats, so it really worked out well. At this time, I'd like to introduce those seated at the platform. Beginning on your left, Representative Lyndall Fraker of Marshfield. Representative Tommy Pearson of St. Louis. Representative Sue Meredith of St. Louis, St. Louis County, excuse me. Speaker of the House Tim Jones of Eureka. Senate President Pro Tem Tom Dempsey of St. Charles. Our host today, Missouri's 55th Governor Jay Nixon. Missouri's First Lady, George Ann Nixon. Our speaker, Hal Donaldson, and his wife, Dory. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'd also like to recognize uh, the following groups and individuals and ask them to stand. We do ask you to hold your applause until the end. The Governor's Student Leadership Forum on Faith and Values to the rear and side. Our statewide elected officials who are here this morning, Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder, State Treasurer Clint Zweifel, State Auditor Thomas Schweik, Attorney General Chris Coster, and Secretary of State Jason Kander. The Justices of the Missouri Supreme Court. The Adjutant General of the Missouri National Guard, Steve Danner. And finally, if all other elected officials would please stand to be recognized. Please give everybody a round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Missouri National Guard. At this time, would you please join us with the, in the Pledge of Allegiance with Major General Danner. To perform our national anthem this morning, we're pleased to have Ryan Burns of the Office of Administration, of Administration and Deborah Walker of the Missouri Department of Health. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting Say, does that star 
Well done, ladies. Thanks so much. Please remain standing for the invocation from Pastor Daniel Hilty of the First United Methodist Church in Jefferson City. Let us pray. O oh God, of all people, you have given us this new year and with it opportunities for each one of us to serve and to grow. Help us at the beginning of this new chapter, at the beginning of this new day, to entrust our worries and anxieties to you and to invite you in. Be present in this hour, O oh God. Be present in us. Be present in our speaker and his wife and our governor and first lady and those who serve by election or appointment or career in our Missouri National Guard, in our clergy, in our lobbyists, in other guests. Give us grateful hearts for the food we're about to eat and those who have prepared it and serve it. Give us joyful hearts for the opportunities of fellowship and prayer and learning and growth. Give us hopeful hearts for the work you are doing in Missouri and well beyond it. Let the seeds of gratefulness and joy and hope which you plant in us now bear the fruit of wisdom and service and love in the year ahead. We pray all these things through your Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. We'll serve breakfast, and the program will continue promptly at 8 o'clock. As you finish your meal, we invite the, that you enjoy two selections by the Hickman High School a cappella singers under the direction of Mr. Matt Feltz, who's a 1999 Hickman graduate.
Thank you. Thank you, Director Feltz and the Hickman Singers. The song you just heard was Daniel, Servant of the Lord. The first one was Hosanna to the Son of David. Well done. And a, a tribute to what Mr. Feltz is doing, but a greater tribute, obviously, to his leadership ability to get high school students dressed like that in an event in Jefferson City <laughs> at 7.30 in the morning. Well done, everybody. Our first reading this morning will be given by Representative Sue Meredith. Our first reading is from the book of Psalms, chapter 119. I seek you with all of my heart. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in the following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I mediate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. At this time, Senate President Pro Tem Dempsey, Speaker Jones, Representative Fraker, and Representative Bonais Mims of Kansas City will lead us in prayer. They will end each with the petition, Lord, in your mercy, and the audience will respond, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask your blessings upon our state and nation. Enable us to make wise use of the abundance you have bestowed upon your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, bless the efforts of those in our state who provide gainful employment for our citizens, those who labor to provide, to provide for their families, those who educate our children, and those who care for the sick, the infirm, and the elderly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you protect those who have put themselves in harm's way on our behalf. The men and women of our armed forces, our law enforcement officers, and our firefighters. Give them strength and courage to do their work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, give guidance to the elected officials, judges, and all public servants of our communities, state, and country to discern and do your will, that we might best serve you and our citizens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you give comfort to those who mourn the loss of a loved one, healing to those suffer from illness and disease, and hope to those who despair from loneliness or the loss of a job. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that we are strengthened and directed to be instruments of your will, so that, in the words of your prophet Amos, justice rolls down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I'm not as tall as the rest. Lord, we ask that you grant wisdom and strength to those who have chosen a life of public service. Bless and direct their work with a noble sense of purpose so that it gives lasting benefit to our citizens. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we bring these prayers before you with praise and thanks, and we ask that you help us do all that we do for your glory. Amen. For our second reading, we'll hear from Representative Tommy Pearson of St. Louis.
The second reading is from uh, the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. Is there any joy in the house? <laughs> Let your gentleness be evidence to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Now it's time to honor, now, pardon me, now it's my honor, now it's time to honor, I'll just read the words on the page. <laughs> <laughs> Operator error, that's what that's called. It's now my honor to introduce the host of the prayer breakfast, Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. Jay Nixon is in his second term as Missouri's 55th governor. He was first elected governor in November 2008 and re-elected in November 2012. A native of DeSoto, Missouri, he was raised in a family of public servants. His mother, the late Betty Nixon, was a teacher and served as president of the local school board. His father, Jerry Nixon, was elected mayor of DeSoto and was a judge for the community. Growing up in a home with these strong examples, Governor Nixon learned at a young age that faith and family come first. And giving back to the community comes next. It's a philosophy that has guided him throughout his career in public service. As governor, he has put forward an agenda to make government more efficient, effective, and responsive to the needs of the Missouri families. He is committed to continuing his work with leaders of both parties to attract the jobs for the future to Missouri, make health care more affordable, and place a college education within the reach of middle class students. Governor Nixon and his wife, George Ann, have two sons, Jeremiah and Wilson. They belong to the First United Methodist Church of Jefferson City. Ladies and gentlemen, Missouri Governor Jay Nixon. Thank you. Thank you, Major Roberts. Um, we appreciate your service to our state, to our country. Um, and for those of you who don't know Mike, uh, he has uh, grown up uh, in the Guard and in the public. Uh, period of time was the uh, uh, meteorologist here locally. So he has uh, been especially useful to us, especially when he was aide-de-camp to, to General Danner for a while during uh, natural disasters of explaining the weather to us uh, in excruciating detail. <laughs> He's also served our country in battle in foreign land um, and is a, a, a great role model and hero and leader for our state. Mike, thank you for your, your great service. For And my, my particular challenge is that I, I knew Sergeant Roberts, I knew Second Lieutenant Roberts, I knew Lieutenant Roberts, I knew Captain Roberts, and now it's an honor to know Major Roberts. So we're uh, a relatively young fellow. I, it's, uh, we're, we're hopeful that that, uh, that path continues to, to rise in leadership for our country. Um, First Lady and I are very pleased to welcome all of you here uh, to the annual Governor's Prayer Breakfast to mark the beginning of the legislative session. We appreciate the great distances that many have traveled to be with us today, uh, especially with the weather that uh, Major Roberts has been unable to control. <laughs> this prayer breakfast is a tradition that goes back more than 50 years. For one morning, we all try, as best we can, 
to put aside the little differences that may arise in our daily jobs and instead stand united in asking guidance from God to direct the course of our state in such a way that best benefits the six million people we all serve together. And in truly asking for God's help and guidance, we humble ourselves. We admit that we don't know all the answers because as the apostle Paul wrote, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Friends, in a room filled with elected officials, humbling ourselves is a pretty big accomplishment. And we also have to remind ourselves that prayer is a conversation, not a monologue. And a conversation in prayer requires us to listen. <clears throat> that's why it's often said there's a reason that God gave us two ears and only one mouth. A famous person of great faith once said, <clears throat> the fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. And the fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. Now, if you're going to quote someone on prayer, Mother Teresa certainly is a pretty good place to start. That was a woman of God who saw past the superficial things that this world seems to prize so much and who knew how a life of prayer makes us complete and leads us looking outward to serve others rather than inward to serve ourselves. A life that looks outward to serve others clearly demonstrates the concept of putting faith into action. Faith in action might be volunteering to mentor young people in your community who need a strong, positive role model, or it might be sharing your time with seniors who welcome someone who will just listen. Faith in action might be building a habitat house in your town or taking tons of badly needed supplies to people who have been left with almost nothing after a natural disaster. It's found in organizations like Convoy of Hope that cross thousands of miles and barriers of borders and language to provide comfort to the afflicted. Like all of you, I'm looking forward to hearing from our speaker this morning about the mission of this organization that has become such a beacon of hope during the darkest of nights. From Joplin, Missouri and Moore, Oklahoma to the islands of Philippines and to Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, when Major Roberts did the introductions earlier, he asked those attending the Governor's Student Leadership Forum to stand and be recognized. Some of you may not be familiar with this organization but for more than 25 years, it has benefited from this breakfast. I had the opportunity to meet with them last night, these outstanding college students chosen by colleges from throughout our state. All public and private colleges bring folks to that. And uh, it's quite a crew. And when you stack that up on 25 years of servant leadership, it makes a huge, huge impact on communities throughout the state. These 70 students are from Missouri's colleges, both public and private. They have been selected by their university presidents to meet this week in Jefferson City during their semester break. These students are giving up part of their time off to meet with key leaders in business and government, and they are here to talk about and learn from the servant leadership philosophy of Jesus of Nazareth. This student forum has the underlying premise that the future prosperity of Missouri depends on a multi-generational dialogue about the faith and values that guide leaders' actions. Now, I'm very pleased that they were with us, will be with us today to hear from Hal Donaldson and to witness how faith and values are applied in leadership from those who they interact with this week. I should also note, the reason I'm giving them such a good promo, the, they're also the folks that are going to be collecting money in the, as, as you leave. Okay? At the end of our program today, those students will be at the doors collecting a free will offering for the Samaritan Center, which provides food and a variety of other basic assistance to those in need here in the central Missouri area. I would ask folks to be generous with them. Uh, the Samaritan Center, most of the folks know from Jeff City, is a multi-denominational center that serves thousands of folks here in the central part of the state. And, and this time of year, as, as everybody in the, in the uh, food bank and food pantry business knows, is the most difficult time after the holidays uh, for families as well as dollars. And I'd ask you to be generous with the uh, 
student leaders for the Samaritan Center. As the 2014 General Assembly moves forward, there will be no doubt areas of disagreement. That is the nature, quite frankly, that is the design of the system of government that we have. It is designed to have difference of opinions. It's designed to have checks and balances. It is designed to take the everyday contention of our state and try to find places where we can harmonize that into concrete, specific actions to move forward. But even during the height of those times of disagreements, it is vital that all of us act in a spirit of fellowship that does not question each other's sincerity in wanting to do what is right. Our prayers can give us the understanding to navigate through these seas ahead and the tolerance for those whose opinions we do not share. It does us no good if we ignore our faith, ignore our values, don't use our ears, only use our mouths, and talk and spout our side. That is why, as Mother Teresa said, prayer and faith lead to listening and lead to peace. So I thank all of you for your continued prayers. I would just say, as a personal note, one of the great benefits of this job, of being the chief executive of the Show Me State, is how time and time again, as George Ann and I travel the state and go to communities around our state, how we have so many people that lean over and whisper in our ear, Governor, we are praying for you. I just want to tell you in this job that that power of prayer and that power of faith gives you a searing strength to cut through what are many frustrations and move forward. And we have that responsibility as Missourians because they are praying for all of us to move our state forward. So I thank all of you for your continued prayers in this room and for Missourians. And as we work to move our great state forward. So. Quite simply, may God continue to bless our state and our great people. Thank you, and God bless. Thanks so much, Governor. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this year's Governor's Prayer Breakfast. Hal Donaldson is the co-founder and CEO of the Springfield-based worldwide humanitarian aid organization, Convoy of Hope. For 20 years, Convoy of Hope has responded to hundreds of disasters in the United States and around the world, including the 2011 tornado in Joplin. And more than $400 million of food and supplies has been distributed to over 63 million people. Just last fall, Mr. Donaldson led an ongoing effort that included volunteers and supplies in response to the widespread damage and destruction from the typhoon that hit the Philippines. For his work with Convoy of Hope, Donaldson received the National Distinguished Service in Social Welfare Award in 2009. Hal Donaldson is the author of more than 30 books, including Midnight in the City, which chronicles his journey to eight American cities where he traveled with police on the midnight shift and walked the streets interviewing drug addicts, gang members, prostitutes, runaways, and the homeless. Hal Donaldson is a member of the Board of Trustees of Oral Roberts University and of the Board of the National Association of Evangelicals. He and his wife, Dory, have four daughters, Lindsay, Aaron Ray, Lauren, and Haley, and they've uh, all joined us here this morning. With that, please join me in welcoming Hal Donaldson. Thank you very much. Great to be with you this morning, and thank you, Major, for those kind words. Very grateful. They are especially appreciated after what happened to me recently at a restaurant in Chicago. I sat down at the table, and the waiter came up to the table and said, Sir, I just want you to know I love your television show. Can I have your autograph? And I said, I'll be happy to give you my autograph, but who do you think I am? 
He said, well, aren't you Donald Trump? <laughs> I promise you, right then and there, I vowed I was going to change my hairstyle. <laughs> but thank you for the invitation, Governor, to be here this morning. It's just truly an honor, and I want to thank you publicly for your support of the work of Convoy of Hope. Thank you so much. And for all of you who serve our great state, thank you for your dedication and your commitment to the citizens of Missouri. We are truly, truly indebted to you, each one of you. Thank you so much. The year was 1776, and George Washington and his army had suffered a series of demoralizing defeats on the battlefield. They had endured a cruel winter, often lacking food, medicine, and supplies. At one point in New York, they found themselves completely surrounded and outnumbered by the British troops. And suddenly, the American Revolution was hanging in the balance. By some accounts, when the situation appeared hopeless, Washington and his army prayed for divine intervention. And then at just the right time, a heavy fog rolled in, which enabled the troops to escape undetected past the British into New Jersey and then on into Pennsylvania. But the will and the determination of the American army would continue to be tested because the British would nip at their heels for five grueling months. Then, in a daring maneuver on Christmas night, Washington led his soldiers across the frigid waters of the Delaware River to make a surprise attack. That one brave decision to cross the Delaware would turn the war in their favor and raise the morale of the entire country. This would be their defining moment. They captured 900 enemy troops and 1,200 weapons without losing a single soldier. That victory would lead to other victories until finally the war was won. Historians have noted that the faith and the courage of these soldiers preserved the dream the revolutionary dream of a republic that would be founded upon liberty and justice for all. Well, today, as we consider the uncertainties of life and all of the things that make us feel anxious, and we look at the challenges that are facing our nation and the world, perhaps we're once again standing on the banks of the Delaware River. And like Washington and his soldiers, we have a decision to make. We can throw up our hands and we can accept defeat, or we can press on together and make 2014 our defining moment. But let me suggest to you that this time, this time, it will take more than courage and military might and ingenuity to navigate the waters that lie before us. It'll take much more than that. This time, it's going to require a renewed commitment to civility and kindness. This time, it's going to require that we live out what Jesus called the greatest commandment of them all, to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. I'm convinced of this. If we will collectively dedicate ourselves to a lifestyle of kindness and compassion, 2014 can be a defining moment for our state and our nation. And in turn, many of the problems that we face those problems will begin to fade because, friend, a year of kindness and compassion can absolutely change everything. A few years ago, I witnessed a robbery in my neighborhood, and I saw the thieves hop the fence and take off running, and I did something you probably shouldn't do, but I hopped in my car and I chased after them. And I pulled my car behind the getaway car so they couldn't escape. And there was a brief confrontation, but fortunately, the authorities came and they were apprehended and the stolen property was recovered. Well, later, the police officers arrived at my house and they wanted to take a formal statement. And then neighbors be began gathering in front of my house as well, and there was a big crowd in front of my house. And I began to tell the story of what had happened, all the details, and I could tell that my 10-year-old daughter, Lauren, was really eating this up. She was listening to every detail, every word. And finally, she made an announcement to the entire crowd. She said, my dad is Batman. <laughs> I have to admit, that was a proud moment for me. <laughs> well, a few days later, the detective returned to ask me some more questions. 
And he too wanted to know what had compelled me to chase after them. He said, Mr. Donaldson, weren't you afraid? They could have had weapons. I looked back at him and I said, sir, I wasn't afraid. I'm Batman. <laughs> the truth is today, we don't need more superheroes. We need selfless heroes. We need people like you and me who will show our children what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. I was 12 years old when two selfless heroes showed me what it meant to love your neighbor as yourself. It was August 1969, and my parents were scheduled to attend a business meeting. My two brothers and I and my sister were supposed to stay home with a babysitter. But the babysitter was late, and so my father instructed us to hop in the back of the car, and we were going to have to go to the business meeting with him. My father was halfway down the road when he looked in his rearview mirror, and he spotted the babysitter pulling into our driveway. And so my father made a U-turn, dropped the four of us kids off, and we would spend the night with the babysitter after all. Minutes later, my father's car was hit by a drunk driver. And he was killed instantly, and my mother was seriously injured, many broken bones, internal injuries, and it would be a long time before she was able to work. That night changed my life, because my dad didn't have much in the way of insurance, and the man who hit him didn't have insurance. And so our family was forced to survive on government assistance and food stamps. I quickly learned what it was like to go to school with holes in my shoes. I went to school with holes in my jeans, and trust me, that's before it was cool to have holes in your jeans. <laughs> but we made it, largely because of the generosity of neighbors who had come to our door week after week with bags of groceries. And as I look back now, every can of soup, every box of cereal, it gave us hope that tomorrow could be better than today. But I will never forget the night that the police came to tell us that my father was dead and my mother was fighting for her life. Neighbors gathered in our front yard and a police officer stepped up to the porch and he addressed the crowd. He said, is there anyone here, a family member or a friend, who will take these four children home with them tonight? Is there anyone who will take them? And just for a moment, it was complete silence. But finally, one couple raised their hand and said, we'll take them. Their names are Bill and Levada Davis, and they invited us not only to stay with them that night, but to live with them for many, many months. Ten of us lived in a single wide trailer for the better part of a year. I'm convinced of this. My brothers, my sister and I, we didn't become angry and bitter because of that year of kindness shown to us by the Davises. They cared for us as if we were their own kids. And time and again, they reminded us that where you start in life, no matter how difficult it may be, where you start in life does not have to dictate where you end. Bill and Levada are now in their 80s. They live in Northern California. And not long ago, we had the opportunity to honor them at a banquet much like this and to tell their story. And I told the crowd that night that without the Davises, there would not be a convoy of hope. And this year, we wouldn't be celebrating our 20-year anniversary. We would not have been able to serve 63 million people without the Davises. But because of their investment in the lives of four children, God was able to take my father's mangled automobile, and he would transform it into a fleet of convoy of hope semi-trucks that are filled with food and supplies that today are crisscrossing this country, helping millions of people across our nation. It wouldn't have happened without the Davises. So this morning, in my remaining moments, I want to share with you three principles the Davises taught us about loving your neighbor. First, they taught us that loving your neighbor requires that we move beyond pity to action. We move beyond pity to action. They taught us that pity has no power, that pity will not feed a hungry child, that tears alone will not provide a home to four children who just lost their father. No, sometimes love requires that we move beyond words and tears and we do something tangible to offer tangible hope. Years ago, I had the privilege, Governor, of meeting Mother Teresa in Calcutta, India. 
And in the course of that conversation, she asked me, she said, young man, what are you doing to help the poor and the suffering? And, you know, I was smart enough to realize it was probably not a good idea to lie to Mother Teresa. <laughs> so I told her the truth. I told her that I wasn't really doing much of anything. And, and she replied, everyone can do something. It was shortly after that that my two brothers and I started the Convoy of Hope. In fact, my brother Steve is here this morning. But right here in Missouri, I have seen compassion in action in a very big way. I've seen citizens make remarkable sacrifices to help their neighbor. I remember attending a Convoy of Hope festival in a community right here in Missouri. And that day, several thousand honored guests showed up to receive free services and free food, and, and it began to drizzle. And the wind was biting cold. And many of our honored guests did not have coats, and they were visibly shaking. Without any prompting whatsoever, hundreds of volunteers began taking off their coats and giving them to the honored guests. As I stand here this morning, I remember one young man who took off this expensive leather jacket, and he draped it around an elderly man. And I saw a teenager take off his down jacket and give it to another kid. It's a sight I will never forget. And just recently, weeks ago, I was speaking at a public event in Kansas City. And when I stepped off the stage, a woman came running toward me, much like a linebacker about to make a tackle. And I braced myself, but she just threw her arms around me and gave me a big hug. And she placed two $1 bills in my hand. And she said, use this to feed a hungry child. As she walked away, I, I noticed that she was wearing tattered sandals and a dress that was two sizes too large. Later I learned, in fact, this woman herself was homeless, and she had likely given me all she had. So much good can be accomplished just with a little kindness. We've seen how a plate of food how a pair of shoes, how a dental screening, a free haircut can give people so much hope. Compassion in action can change a community and alter the course of a nation. A year of kindness and compassion can change everything. Second, the Davis has taught us that sometimes loving your neighbor requires that we cooperate around a common vision. Cooperate around a common vision. I've heard our governor talk a lot about that over the years. But with 10 of us living in a small trailer, we had to learn to work together. You see, there weren't enough beds for everyone, and so we had to take turns sleeping on the floor. And there weren't enough dinner settings, and so we had to take turns eating dinner. We had to work together because we knew there was no other place to go. We had to make this work. But as you can imagine, with all those kids living in such tight quarters, occasionally there were conflicts. But to their credit, Bill and Levada Davis would not allow disagreements to lead to disunity. We were in this together. We had to make it work. Inside that trailer, we witnessed the power of cooperation. Well, right here in Missouri, following the 2011 Joplin tornado, we saw how the pursuit of a common vision could bring us together. In fact, I want to thank our governor. I want to thank all of you who are public servants. Thank you for your incredible leadership in the wake of that tragedy. Can we express appreciation to them this morning? Absolutely. I had the distinct honor of speaking in Joplin on the one-year anniversary of the tornado, and that evening the community gathered to remember the fallen and to honor all the recovery workers. And I told the crowd that night that Joplin will not be remembered for the buildings that were destroyed. It will be revered for how its citizens rolled up their sleeves and worked together to rebuild their city. The citizens of Joplin were an inspiration to the nation. Despite their different perspectives, their different religious beliefs, their different political positions, 
they decided that in order to rebuild their city, they needed each other. I think you would agree with me that in America today, we have a choice. We can allow ourselves to be enslaved by division, or we can focus on a common mission. We can set our eyes on the things that divide us, or we can embrace a vision that unites us. The citizens of Joplin and the Davis family demonstrated that a year of kindness and cooperation can change everything. And then lastly, the Davis has taught us that loving your neighbor and giving hope to people is not expensive, but neither is it free. Giving hope to people is not expensive, but neither is it free. It requires that you and I choose a life of generosity so that others can have a life of opportunity. Inviting four children to live in their trailer cost the Davises their privacy. It drained their personal savings account. But their generosity, their sacrifice gave four kids a future filled with opportunity. Living generously brought the Davises Davis so much joy and fulfillment. But this morning, think about this. Each one of us, each one, must choose the priority that will guide our lives. We can live exclusively for ourselves, or we can spend a portion of ourselves giving hope and joy to others. The choice is ours. Each year, 40,000 volunteers give of their time to participate in Convoy of Hope's citywide festivals. This is where government, businesses, um, churches, civic organizations all come together to provide free medical and dental screenings, job fairs, free shoes, haircuts, and much, much more. In fact, through a partnership with the National Breast Cancer Foundation, women are now receiving uh, free screenings and, and mammograms. But these festivals, the best way to describe them, they're like this large carnival with lots of rides and games for kids, lots of balloons and hot dogs. And one, one particular year, I was volunteering at one of the hot dog stands at one of these events. And a young boy came up to me, and he was wearing a soil t-shirt, and he was a scrawny kid. And he asked me, he said, can I have a hot dog? I said, sure. Do you want one with mustard, one with ketchup, one with mustard and ketchup, or do you want it plain? This was a smart kid. He said, can I have one of each? I loaded that kid up with hot dogs that day, and with a huge smile on his face, he proceeded to stick one hot dog in each pocket. Four hot dogs, costing less than one dollar, kept hope alive for one hungry boy. Four hot dogs, less than one dollar, kept hope alive. Giving hope to people is not expensive, but neither is it free. Friends, a year of kindness and generosity can change everything. I'll close with this. Abraham Lincoln did not always attend service on Sundays because his presence created quite a disruption to the service. But he would often attend the midweek service at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. And he would sit in the pastor's study and he would listen to the sermon in relative seclusion. While returning from one of the midweek services, one of his aides asked, Mr. Lincoln, what did you think of tonight's sermon? Lincoln replied, it was well thought out, powerfully delivered, very eloquent. The aide said, so you thought it was a great sermon? Lincoln replied, no, no, it failed. Because tonight, the reverend did not ask us to do something great. As we embark on 2014, let me encourage you to make this a defining moment. Do something great for yourself and your nation. Love your neighbor as yourself. God bless you this morning.
Mr. Donaldson, thank you for those compelling words. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our program is almost complete. It's almost concluded. Before we finish up today, I'd like to remind you about the free will offering that will be taken at the doors by the students from the Governor's Student Leadership Forum to benefit the mission of the Samaritan Center here in Jefferson City. Our benediction will be given by Pastor Hilty. Will you please pray with me? O oh Lord, now send us out to seek you with our whole hearts. Help us to treasure your words that we have heard this hour. Help us to rejoice in them, to meditate upon them, to be changed by them. This year, let us offer your kindness and your generosity and your hope to all people and to see you clearly in all of your children who hunger or who are in need of shelter, who are in need of care. Help us to serve and to lead in ways that change us and change the world to reveal your hope and to reveal your heart in all things. We pray in your holy name. Amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that will uh, conclude this year's event. Governor, thank you for the opportunity. You put on another great prayer breakfast this morning. Thank you. And as a reminder, as we head out the door, don't forget about the uh, Governor's Student Leadership Forum and their free will offering for the Samaritan Center as you exit.